All right, time for another Tacky Talk with State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy. Hi, Tacky. Morning, Joe. Good to see you again on another Friday. This actually is going to be a beautiful Friday and beautiful weekend for a change. We've been having some uh, rough Fridays between the two of us. I know. It looks pretty good for the uh, Flag Day Parade. Are we going to see you marching this year? I'll be there. Uh, I believe it's still a 7 o'clock kickoff like it normally is. And uh, just a quick walk down Hancock Street uh, from Queens Center to Marymount Park. And uh, as opposed to a, a barbecue or anything else, it looks like it's just uh, just to say some hellos and fireworks at the beach. Yeah, it's you know going to be the first, uh, I think, big in-person event for a lot of people. Um, so I think a lot of folks are anticipating at least uh, – being able to uh, greet each other, uh, if if from six feet away or not, at least to see them in person. I agree. I, I've, I've been able to go to a few more events. Uh, th- they're actually this week alone. Plus, I've actually been in a restaurant to eat dinner, and uh, my comfort level is gradually getting better as right? so I'm out. Uh, but I also know that uh, Chowder Fest is on in Hell's Neck. If you see the Facebook community page, uh, it's going to be said Saturday, uh, September 11th. Um, and uh, there's also going to be um, Family Fun Day in House Neck on July 3rd. So you know, I think things are gradually coming back to life. You know, Philip at Queen's Asian Resources indicates they want to try to pull off an August Moon Festival. It'll be oh. a much more trimmed down version. Uh, so um, we'll see how it goes. I think a lot of people are preparing, uh, even if it's not a full scale event, uh, at least an event at some level, uh, you know, some point. You know, the rest of the year. Yeah, well, it's uh, May 29th is when uh, the restrictions were lifted. And of course, coming up uh, Tuesday, June 15th, the state of emergency comes to an end. I know some action has been taken at the legislature this week uh, to extend some of those uh, orders, right? Yeah, the Senate has uh, passed a bill to extend some of those orders. It's, uh, I'm not sure what we're doing in the House yet, to be perfectly honest. So the Senate, you know, did some of those orders and kind of overextended themselves. We did some stuff in the supplemental budget as well yesterday. So one of the things that a big deal is they decided to extend uh, takeout alcohol and cocktails at restaurants to uh, next year of March of 2022. They also uh, expanded outdoor dining to April of next year as well. But the language in the back of the bill is confusing me a little bit about exactly how they did it. Uh, for you, those who don't realize this, there is no public uh, hearing or public notification requirement for outdoor dining. It just happens. So if you are, live near a restaurant, which um, in Quincy, there aren't too many places that uh, have residential areas you know, directly abutting a restaurant facility. But some communities, there are like very close residential to, to restaurants. Like we're talking like, you know, within less than 100 feet, like really close. You know, suddenly there's a pop-up outdoor dining. You don't know what happened. It's because right, you know, the governor set it up that they don't have to tell anybody. So it appears that the uh, Senate is continuing that uh, processes. As I said, I, I was reading it last night. It's a little bit confusing that then. They want a continuation of the um, uh, you know, quorum of public meetings through the Zooms. They, they're going to extend that out. Um, so, I mean, they, they made some moves in a quite few areas. And the House has uh, got the bill last night and we're looking at uh, what our options are going into next week. Given the fact that deadline's very close on June 15th, uh, this this is going to be a, a tight one. Um, so we got basically the weekend and I have to check the schedule later today, but I suspect it's going to be in session uh, Monday or Tuesday uh, for a really rapid conversation about how this is going to play out, which is going to bump heavily into my hearing schedule. Uh, because I'm running public hearings next week and uh, a few other things going on Tuesdays and I'm on the move. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, we also voted to do uh, mail-in ballots. Yes. Part of the uh, supplemental budget, uh, especially looking at the municipal elections this fall. Uh, we've talked about this before. I'm, I'm still a scr- head scratcher regarding the constitutionality of this. In fact, that uh, absentee ballots very specifically state how they operate in the Constitution. So I'm not sure this is going to play out, hmm, uh, okay. to be honest with you. We'll see what the Senate does. And I suspect a whole bunch of, a bunch of people in election law, uh, legalese, who are much better than I am, are also in the process of scratching heads trying to figure it out. Interesting. I know I've talked to the city clerk here in Quincy. Uh, she is prepared to move forward with mail-in and early voting if, if it's so approved. 
Yeah, right now we have mail-in ballots, but stay tuned. It could be early voting as we move along. Uh, you know, we'll see what the uh, town clerks come up with. Obviously, that's we do take some guidance from them as we move forward. Okay. Um, how is the uh, quote-unquote power struggle going between the legislature and the governor regarding the federal uh, pandemic relief money, Jackie? Well, the power struggle has been very, very quiet power struggle from the governor's office. Uh, we uh, create a special trust fund to migrate three point, uh, I'm sorry, five point three billion. I got my numbers back. It's five point three billion, uh, the, the stimulus dollars into there. The uh, money has to be spent over a three-year period, so it isn't like a $5.3 billion drop in one day. Uh, we are actually one of the few states that got the lump sum. Uh, most states are getting theirs over multi-year disbursement, so this is actually very unique uh, to us. Um, and uh, unlike cities and towns, uh, the majority of this money is non-discretionary, meaning it has to be applied to specific projects. So well, we sort that out. Uh, Mass Taxpayer Foundation has put out uh, some guidance uh, on their analysis. Uh, Mass Taxpayer Foundation is a business-funded uh, uh, not-for-profit who uh, does analysis and it's basically a type of watchdog group uh, regarding uh, fiscal issues in the state. And they believe that about a billion one of that is discretionary. I mean, we have a lot of options where we can use that money. Um, so we we'll still try to sort it out. A lot of it is dedicated toward education, transportation, water, sewer infrastructure, uh, and then a very broad concept of public health, ranging from COVID-related to like COVID-related mental health. So it's actually a pretty uh, broad definition as far as they can see. Uh, but again, it has to be somewhat directly tied to COVID in one form or another. Yeah. Um, so we shall, we're, we're gonna work it out as we go along. I suspect, uh, again, sometime this fall, uh, if not a little sooner, we're going to start, uh, you know, having some debates about how to do uh, disbursement. We are having meetings. I got a meeting coming up with the um, chair of state administration regulatory oversight uh, about, you know, what I'm thinking on some of these funds. Uh, I suspect the other chairs will be reaching out uh, in different committees, like transportation and others, uh, to the membership to see what they're thinking. Okay. I know that uh, some of the funds uh, were already released to some of the uh, quote-unquote hard hit. Um, communities. Um, so will there be more for those communities too, or is, or is that it? I, I don't know if that's it. Uh, that money wasn't directed to us. That was directed to the governor directly from the okay. administration. Okay. So the, uh, the Biden administration released those funds directly to the governor first. It okay. won't be the last. You're going to see that as well. Certain funds will bypass us if there's you know, preordained, so to speak. It's already been directed where it's going. Yeah. Um, but not all the funds are coming through the state. For example, the $46 million in stimulus that uh, City Quincy got bypassed the legislature. We we didn't appropriate that money. We didn't direct that money. We didn't even see that money in the okay. offers. That went straight to the City of Quincy, and I believe what something like two hundred million dollars. I, I, I saw in the Patriot Ledger. I can't remember the exact number, but it's like it's a substantial amount of money straight to, went straight to Norfolk County. Which I promise you, Norfolk County has never seen that much money. Right. Yeah. I mean, they don't have a lot of revenue sources, the registry deeds, the golf courses, uh, things like that. But that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. They've never seen that money before. I mean, most of the counties are going to get sums they've never seen the existence of a county. You know, the majority of that money will be redispersed back to cities and towns. Okay. Um, and there will be a formula for you to do that. But it's up to the, clerk, uh, the county commissioners to decide how to uh, do those redisbursements. Um, in some form that's, you know, proportionate to the size of communities, but right. they have some flexibility figured out. So Quincy will be getting more money. Um, actually, every community in the state will be getting some more money via the county system. Okay. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, the counties did get money, but given the severity of the state of emergency, you know, with the height of the, particularly once we moved into the uh, height of the first wave, mm -hmm. you know, that, the county actually gave us uh, that money to the state to help address a lot of the COVID-related costs. Right. State was much better uh, equipped to distribute it than the county's government, certainly. Uh, in other parts of the country, county government's very strong, but not so much around here. Oh, absolutely. You know, some parts of the country, the county government runs the hospital system, the right. social service system, um, not just prisoners like we do here and some local public safety. They run uh, the entire healthcare network. Yeah. So, uh, Given the fact that you know all the stimulus bills the federal government put out is not customized per state, 
it is a one size fit all situation. But, you know, this is what happens. So they have to put some uh, provisos in for uh, states that do not have a uh, strong or functional county governments or even county governments at all. Right. Uh, yeah. To to you know, do disbursements, they're supposed to spend it themselves. So uh, again, it reflects the fact that you know we, we live up here we're very provincial, but we tend to forget that once we leave Massachusetts, uh, those forms of governments are very different from ours. It's very true. Yes, even in New Hampshire, actually, there's a stronger uh, system for countywide, just because it's more rural. I think. Well, exactly. Yeah, because you're able to uh, do localized resources and yeah. you can tell locally. So. You know, I always point to places like uh, Texas in particular. The yeah. legislature is actually extremely weak. It's a very weak state government. It, it, the counties really control everything. Yep. Uh, Florida is our example. County government is yep. much more powerful than the state government. Um, and uh, those states have uh, part-time legislatures. Mm-hmm. Very part-time <laughs> legislatures. You know, they, they run, you know, I don't believe they run a full nine months and two years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's a completely different, different uh, operating structure. Yeah, uh, those county elections become much more important. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, travelers uh, to southern states, beware. Uh, <laughs> county sheriffs have a lot of authority, and county judges too. <laughs> yeah, if you guys uh, move out of the, the state to yeah, right to the south, especially the south and Midwest, you know, definitely be prepared to uh, change how you talk to your politicians. And also, more importantly, look at how your tax bill works. It's very right. different. So just yeah. because the state has no income taxes or low income taxes doesn't mean you don't have county taxes and That's county, right. and county services. So when you do a lot of these tax analysis you know, regarding states, uh, they don't always uh, filter down to that next level of government uh, that has taxation powers beyond the state. Yeah. Um, was there action taken on the quote-unquote millionaire's tax this week, Techie? Yeah, we took a vote this week um, to send it to the ballot in 2022. So uh, there were more than sufficient number of legislatures, uh, legislators uh, to vote in favor of putting on a ballot. So come up uh, in 2022, November, you get a chance to vote on uh, providing a increase uh, income tax for every person making more than $101 million. It's pretty simple. Mm. Um, add another 6%. And that might be dedicated towards education and transportation funding. Okay. Um, how did you vote on it? I voted yes. I voted yes before. I voted yes this time. And it's up to the voters to decide if they want to vote yes. Uh, it actually be a very interesting vote to observe. Um, historically speaking, when you put a ballot question to remove a tax, it, ha- it happens. Sure. I mean, yeah. I've never seen anybody put anything on a ballot that involves taxes and not result in a no. Um, and uh, this is actually a very interesting part because uh, unlike uh, other tax proposals, this actually affects a very small segment of the Massachusetts population. Right. I think in Quincy, uh, there's not even five people that make uh, more than a million dollars that would be affected by this yeah. tax. Uh, it, it's a very small part of the population. So It'll be interesting to see how uh, the voters respond to this. I suspect it'll be a pretty strong advertising campaign by wealthy mm-hmm. people to advertise against this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and we'll see if uh, proponents have any money to ab- uh, advertise in favor of this. Yeah. Uh, you know, very simple question. Uh, but uh, I think that advertising campaign was, we, we can continue talking next year, but the advertising campaign uh, next, you know, October, November on this yep. matter, but actually pretty fascinating. Yeah, and this is a little different. I know that um, Senator Warren has been talking about a wealth tax, which is completely different. Um, do you think that's a better way to go? Uh, actually, my personal opinion is you know, we should do a minimum tax. I mean, everybody should pay some kind of bare minimum. And then yeah. we'll, the, the, the thing is that the way the tax code is set up at the state and federal level, but even more federal than the state, to be honest with you. Uh, because the federal tax code is, is much more complex and so many other moving parts of deductions and credits and exemptions and so forth that you, know, you end up not paying any taxes. As you've seen in the news, you know, guys like uh, Jeff Bezos pays zero personal income taxes. Right. I know a lot of their income is passive. I mean, you know, it's all stock driven and because they just reduce the size of their salary the longer they're there. Right. You know, we, we get that. But, um, you know, that passive income doesn't become taxable income until you actually take it out mm-hmm. at some level. And I kind of get that too. Uh, but 
oh, it is still taxable even if you generate passive income, even if you don't take it out. Okay. So it's, it, it, look, I mean, it's a federal tax code game and something gets conflated with the state tax code. And it's really two different issues. Well, there are a lot of commonalities and identical. Yeah. And I think that happens to the public a lot. They, they work in a presumption that, you know, it's a federal versus state, federal, federal versus state tax codes. But we do have a lot of similarities that tie them together, like student loan deduction, because I still have student loans, mm-hmm. you know, actually are tied together for the sake of ease. They can fill it on the Fed. You can fill it on the state. You just mm-hmm. use the same formula calculation. Right, right. Conversely, we talked about this before, the senior circuit, uh, tax break on real estate is strictly a state tax credit that doesn't exist in the federal level. Yep. So, I mean, it, it, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't always the same. I think people tend to think they're the same thing, but they're not like they're a graduated tax. We're a flat income tax. You, that, to, to me, that's the most inequitable part of it is the flat tax rate because, you know, 5% of somebody making $50,000, they're going to be paying a lot larger portion of their income to taxes than somebody making $150,000. Yeah, it's 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 inequitable. It's but it's not the most progressive. I mean, the most progressive taxes is property taxes, right? Because value of property does not reflect value of uh, cash. Yeah, it should not be called property taxes. It should be called no. Taxes. It has nothing to do with the property. <laughs> no, it's very regressive, and uh, the sales tax is highly regressive because, yep. as you point out, it's a flat tax. So your ability to pay a sales tax or luxury tax or use tax or whatever kind of tax on goods and services. You know, for a person that's worth a uh, hundred million dollars versus a person that's worth uh, fifty thousand dollars, or it's it's like a world apart in yep. terms of conversation and taxation. Flat taxes is, is follows the same principle, yep. where uh, you know if you're all paying the same amount, then the this portional impact is always going to be on a person that have pays less. The problem we have is that certain portions of the population don't pay anything. Yep. And this whole trick down economics makes no sense to me because, you know, you have a lot of money, but you're not buying stuff at the local pizza shop that keeps the economy moving. You know, people buy yachts. That does nothing for the majority of the population regarding economic stimulus. I mean, th- th- these all arguments I look, listen, it was like, have you, like, I visit a place that built yachts in a, in a Taiwan trip as part of my many travels overseas, it feels like. But I wish we could have travel with these again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's true. I mean, th- those things are like a million dollars in maintenance. You need to hire a crew of five and you eat a whole lot of fuel for a thing that leaves the port once every like year in many yep. cases. And I'm using a rather extreme example regarding yeah. yeah. But you know, th- this is this is kind of the reality. I mean, a wealthy car doesn't result in more local stimulus. I mean, the person that we learned through pandemic. You and I, as local folks who are not wealthy, run the economy. Mm-hmm. We kept the restaurant going as the best we could. We try to do local retail the best we could. We run the online shopping. You know, and, and, but yeah, adversely, you had these kind of effects on gas stations because we weren't driving as much. <clears throat> so if you want an example of you know, what drives the economy, you yourself listen to this at home is the reason the economy works. And as I've been saying constantly, you know, you know, please, you know, comply with the health standards. And even now I tell people who business has heightened sanitation and mask wearing because they continue to be concerned about COVID. Mm-hmm. Just be polite and comply. Yeah. <clears throat> because you're the one that's actually keeping their economy going. Yeah, that's absolutely true. No question. It's a lot of power in the, in the middle class and the upper middle class, for sure. I think people are realizing for the first time um, the power they do have. Oh, absolutely. And you saw G7 this week discuss a a minimum corporate tax of 15% because corporations don't always, or many times, don't actually pay their taxes to get a lot of refunded back to them uh, or to move the money in a manner that can't be taxed, Mm -hmm. particularly offshore. So like companies like Apple, for example, is very cash rich, just not in the United States. They bury the money in other countries that have uh, their essential tax havens. But that results in them not spending money back into U.S. infrastructure for their business. So it has all kinds of ripple effects. If they don't have the money here, they can't spend the money here because they get taxed on it. But on the flip side, they do bring it, if they uh, are trying to hide their money and there's no tax on it, then the taxpayers don't get anything and they don't actually have to spend the money right. in the U.S. And it is, it is an interesting question, uh, uh, particularly after the G7 nations uh, agreed to this concept of minimum corporate tax, meaning everybody pays a minimum. 
uh, Europeans actually find our tax systems fairly confusing. Actually, most of the world finds our confusing because uh, when they have their income, uh, when taxes take out of their income, that's it. There's no like mystery here. There's no like a bazillion deductions. There's no refunds. There's right. no overpayment. That is it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's much more fair to everybody. If the government would just say, we're taking this percentage out of you based on this income bracket, end of story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think oh, our lives would be a lot easier. Uh -huh. But then again, the flip side, you don't get, you know, you wouldn't get tax credits either. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we wouldn't have the, uh, the senior circuit breaker. You wouldn't have, um, you know, other types of tax credits on the back of your, of your tax bill. So on one side, I really like the idea that I just don't have to deal with it again as taxpayer. For the simplicity yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the flip side, you know, it could adversely affect certain folks. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> that's the nature of, of our democracy, right? It's confusing. <laughs> it is confusing. And tax taxation is always extremely confusing. Yeah. And, and we always want something for free. It's been my experience of government my whole life. People want, uh, people want stuff. Uh, they don't care how you pay for it uh, because it's not their problem. And it's always going to be the legislature and the government's problem for how to fund programs or cut programs. Um, that people may not need or want anymore. You know, maybe something comes obsolete or we just can't fund it anymore. But conversely, yeah. I've never heard one person ever tell me, I'm, I want you to take away my program. That will never happen. I can promise you that. I get the right <laughs> to say, to say, you should reduce taxes by taking away something I receive as a, <laughs> whether it be a tax credit, whether it be a, um, a healthcare issue, housing issue. Yep. Whether it be deductions for uh, student loans, would be deductions for rent, would be yep. deductions uh, that we provide uh, for adopting kids. You know, a lot of things are in there. So if you're one of the beneficiaries, you know, I, I, I will promise you, no one ever said you should <laughs> take that away. And that's the nature of public service tagging <laughs> that you've been doing for so long. <laughs> yes, uh, it's uh, it's definitely one of those things. <laughs> you have to one consistent thing in my life, very yeah. consistent. Yeah. Um, have to keep it kind of short this week uh, because of time constraints, but uh, anything else you want to let us know about? Um, at this stage of the game, you know, there's going to be a lot of activity coming to Hill. Uh, you know, if people are interested, you can look at my Facebook. There's more Facebook live hearings and the awkwardness of Facebook live hearings. He wants me being very awkward. Hmm. Uh, that, you know, State Representative Tacky Chan's Facebook page. Uh, they'll be uh, starting uh, this past Monday and this coming Monday, there'll be a lot going on. Um, and, uh, you know, and the COVID numbers are getting much better overall. We'll touch on really fast. COVID numbers are getting better really uh, quickly as we're moving down into uh, triple digit infection, daily infection rates. So uh, the vaccines do matter to do work. It's not just about warm weather and outdoors because right. uh, even last year's warm weather and outdoors, we still had pretty strong numbers. So vaccines matter. So, you know, please do that. And, uh, there's uh, redistricting issues uh, that are coming through. Um, and uh, we won't get our census numbers again since September 30th unless the feds move into the timetable. We actually had to change the law uh, this week. Uh, we're going to try to change the law. The Senate has the bill now, but the House voted on the bill uh, that's in the Senate to uh, let the legislature draw its lines ahead of the cities and towns. This does not mean the state's going to draw the precinct lines or the wards. Uh, depending what districts, depending what town or city you live in, everyone calls it different. But in Quincy, we're not going to change, we're not going to write the lines for the city of Quincy, but we're going to get to uh, draw these, uh, th our own districts using the most recent census data mm -hmm. ahead of it. And I'm still not sure how this is going to work, um, but we shall see as we move forward. I think you're going to see a very, very, very hectic situation with. Um, cities and towns and the state uh, on, on drawing our districts. For those who don't realize uh, in the Massachusetts Constitution, particularly for state representatives, you have to live in the district for one full year from the prior election to run for state representative. Yeah. So more so than any other part of government, uh, state representatives are under a serious crunch to ensure that people who desire to run for office uh, in, in a state representative district has the opportunity to do so. All right. Stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, website, phone number? 617-722-2014. Uh, 617-722-2014. We're still operating remotely, so smash a button. 
so to speak, and uh, leave a voicemail. We'll, we'll get back to you. And uh, tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T A C K E Y dot C H A N at mahouse.gov. I will be um, getting a lot of more email. Obviously, I've already received a lot of testimony. We do okay. see your email uh, when we get it. So I do sift through it on my phone every day. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tacky. Good to talk to you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good to talk to you, and uh, I'll see you in a week or so.